All right. So tonight we're fortunate to have as our featured speaker, Mark Kurgel, um, and who is joining us from Germany. So we're, oh. we're very thankful that he was willing to uh, make that time zone challenge to be with us. And I'll have a little bit more on him later when I introduce him just before his, his speech, uh, his presentation. And then we have member presentations uh, tonight from Pat Welly, Susan Turner, and Carol Isaac. So I think without further ado, we're just going to launch into those, uh, those presentations. So Pat, are you ready to go? Pat Welly? Uh, yeah, I can go ahead. I had to unmute you. Okay. <laughs> So uh, Pat Welly is presenting first, and she is doing presenting on a work in progress, Images of the Coastal Forest. So Pat, take it away. Okay, if you can give me, I guess I just do slides, share screen again, huh? You should be able to I think grab it. we would it. know this by now, right? Yeah. All right, let's see if this will work. I'm trying something new this time. So, do you guys see that coastal forest slide? Yes. yes. Okay. That's good to hear. Okay, so yeah, like I like he said, I'm just showing a few images that I'm starting uh, this collection. You all know, of course, that I live on the coast now up here in Willapa Bay. And I've been, you know, traipsing around the forest. So a lot of the uh, photos that I'm gonna show, well, the photos I'm doing tonight are just a work in progress. So coastal forests, they're very messy and complex. And part of what I'm enjoying about them is the challenge of trying to portray these, both the full systems and the individual pieces of the systems. And it's kind of interesting to say the least. I don't know if you are familiar with a uh, person, Alexander von Humboldt. He lived in the early 1800s and he was a German geographer, scientist, philosopher, they called them then, I believe. But he laid the foundation of sorts for the science of ecology. He was also one of those that influenced Darwin's studies. But what interests me is what he does to try to communicate his <coughs> observations. And he challenged artists um, to portray the unity of interconnected systems that underlie any landscape. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start looking at these messy places. If I can advance my slides, there we go. So I'm just gonna show you a few of these images. All of these were taken near the mouth of the Columbia River or right around Willapa Bay. So all kind of my backyard. And you know, there's many ways of describing a coastal forest, certainly key species or with respect to rain levels, if you want to talk that direction. But when you're deep within these forests, a few choice words come to mind. Uh, wet, shady, complex. Those are my first three, but you know, there's, there's plenty of them. This particular one is actually a, what would be technically called a forested wetland. It's near Cape Disappointment, but um, you know, it definitely has this lack of orderliness, but I'm still trying to make interesting images out of it as well. This is a similar location. And this is a little bit higher, drier area though, right on the coast. Um, just again, there's lots of interesting lights, lots of uh, different things going on here. This is an area that is being rejuvenated. I believe this particular cedar, you know, made it past the chainsaws that came through here, but they've been trying to rejuvenate this area for about 50 years now. So there's really a lot of the complexity starting to happen. And then one for scale. Scale is something on trying to display these areas that is, again, fascinating to work, to look at. Another nice little area in, in one of these. And there's water of all sorts, of course, fog, rain, you name it. Well, okay, we don't get snow much, so.
This is a red cedar that is just covered in this cattail moss, they call this, and then a close up of another area. And of course, lots of ferns. Again, trying to get to some of the, you know, real pieces of it, but, but also showing it as a whole and some of the critters. Mm -hmm. This is a Pacific tree frog. You can tell by the face mask he's got on. And, you know, they try to hide there in the leaf, in the leaf litter, which they usually do a pretty good job, but then they move and, you know, then you see them. And this is just some jelly fungi. They like to grow on dead wood. This happens to be an old cedar tree that uh, I believe it's cedar. It was one of the older old trees out by uh, the Lewis and Clark camp. There's an area in Cape Disappointment that's not far from where I live and I spend a lot of time up in those woods and they, I found recently some of these really interesting, they're western hemlocks, that their roots are pretty much growing out of other stumps. I don't know, I haven't been able to determine if the area was once logged and if it was, it had to have been many, many, many years ago. But a lot of these are just, the, the root systems are quite a bit above ground. And so I just have a short group of those. These are probably, you know, my height that just the root systems themselves. And then I'll just end it with, this is actually a sunrise, not far from where I live. And that's it. Beautiful. So Pat, <laughs> Pat, are you interested in showing us the calm that's within what you consider the chaotic forest? Is that your sort of goal? Uh, I'm sorry, can, is that Ray? Yeah. I'm gonna go stop my screen share so I can see if I, um, say that again, sorry. So I'm curious if it seems like you're trying to show us the calm that you can find within the chaos that is the deep forest, is that kind of it? That's a nice way of putting it because whenever I'm out there, you know, I'm generally completely in the moment. And the sounds are of course all muffled. There's not a lot out there. You can start to hear, you know, Frank, for example, if the frogs move, you can actually hear them. So. Yes, to some degree, I think that's what I'm trying to show. But well, I think, again, go ahead. I think it's working. I mean, they look nice in that way. I think it's good. And, and I think your idea of putting yourself in there for scale, there's a slightly well-known photographer who lives in Astoria now who spent a lot of time taking pictures in the woods and put his wife out there quite a bit yeah. for that yeah. same thing. So uh, I think that's a great, because none of us, those of us who don't go out there a lot don't realize just how big that stuff is. Right, and it's really hard to capture that. I mean, most of the times I'm out there hiking by myself, but so now I'm trying to look around for, you know, other things that can be a clue as to the scale and sometimes just looking straight up. So at least you get the idea of, you know, the depth of field you're looking for or you're, you're in helps a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's been interesting. You mentioned um, at the beginning of your presentation, Alexander von Humboldt, mm -hmm. there's a, a wonderful biography of him called The Invention of Nature by Andrea Wolf, which uh, oh, okay. I highly recommend. Yeah, I'm working my way through Cosmos now. So <laughs> that's one of his, you know, more famous books there, but or the essay is the first volume of it, I believe. But uh, yeah, I just started reading about him and I was quite fascinated. Pat, one of the things I'm totally amazed in, in your photographs is the variety of ground cover that, mm -hmm. uh, that you have in those forests. I mean, like everything from grasses to, uh, you know, to, to ferns or whatever is at the other end of, of grasses. Right. Yeah. And so, again, I mentioned briefly the key species. I mean, you've got, you don't have that many key species. There's Western red cedar, Western hemlock, and then you get major types of ferns. You can always see those, but what's fascinating to me is 
how many of everything you see. So trying to isolate whether it's a grass or whether it's a moss or, you know, to make up part of that whole, that's, that's what I'm kind of trying to get. One of the things that I think about is like, I wonder how much influence, you know, like uh, humans have had in like the amount of ground cover that's, right. uh, that's on there. And also like the, obviously the trees. Right. Well, of course, there's very little old growth left. Um, you can find small patches of it. Someone told me about an area over east of Willapa Bay that I'm going to go out and explore tomorrow. Um, and I want to actually see the differences there in ground cover as well as other things. In true old growth, what does it really look like? I mean, just within the short area that I'm, that I'm in around Willapa Bay, I can go to all kinds of different areas that are technically coastal forests, but they're all different. So it's, it's a pretty fascinating area. But yeah, the ground cover is, you know, complex. That's a beautiful presentation, Pat. Um, I wonder if you're familiar with the work of, uh, since we have a German uh, speaker today, um, yeah, I wonder I... if you're familiar with the work of Karl Blossfeld? No. Uh, of the, I think he was, uh, he photographed plant life at the turn of the century. I can't remember, maybe Mark uh, knows. Um, are you familiar with his work, Mark? I, I, unfortunately, I'm not, but I'm going to look him up. Yeah. Uh, Carl, <laughs> with the K, of course, B-L-O-S-S-F-E-L-D-T, Carl Blossfeld. He did a series, an important series called uh, Art Forms in Nature that, Pat, I recommend to you. Great. You want to Google him and take a look. But uh, his was a little different from yours, although I did see a few examples of very close up uh, oh, okay. photography, but he does a lot of very detailed uh, images of uh, all sorts of plant life. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, I think he was fascinated with kind of architectural details okay. of, of uh, plants. Cool. Uh, so some of your uh, images reminded me of him. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll definitely look that up. And, and Don, I didn't get to write down real quickly. What was the book that you recommended of Von Humboldt. It's called The Invention of Nature. Okay. And I believe the author is Andrea Wolf, W-U-L-F. I'm sure, I, I'm pretty sure I heard of it um, well, it's, in looking um, through his stuff. It, it, it's very in, interesting for, even for people who aren't interested in natural history. He's, he was a, a, a fascinating man and uh, um, it's an inter interesting story why he isn't more well known today. Yeah, when you when you start reading of, about him and you realize how much he contributed, but Darwin was there and Darwin published. You know, we all know Darwin, but he was there ahead of uh, before that in, in a lot of ways. So. Well, great. Thank Pat, you, Pat. I think one of the real strengths of what you what you were showing us tonight was moving from macro to micro, your close-ups really help bring a feeling of the texture of the forest to the, to the presentation. Okay. Good to hear. Good to hear. Very nice, Very nice. Pat. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Pat. So Susan, who just disappeared from her chair, I was gonna call on next, are you? Sorry. <laughs> Are you there, Susan? <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll we'll change the order a little bit. Um, and Carol, are are you ready to queue up? I I am. You know, it's always um... give it a shot. This this screen share should be available to you. And. Um, uh, we see yes. your. I think we see your screen. There we go. Wait a second. Um, I'm. Uh, Doug. I think there are more people who want to join the meeting. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up. Let me see if I can find them and admit them. 
Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. So um, as Carol, as you're getting queued up, Carol, I've just mentioned is going to be uh, showing images which she is calling work from the inside during COVID. Um, so I'm going to go enlarge the images all the way down to this black space, but I won't talk about them. Then I will come back and talk about them and take questions. So uh, here goes. Does every, can everybody see an individual image? Yes. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, I'm going to start here. So everything, everything here is either from inside my house or from very close to my house, um, some yards away. Um, and I've begun with artichokes that somebody of, is growing right outside of their house. Um, and this is my... Uh, my model, who's who's not so happy to be a model all the time, but he's he's stuck with me, and I'm stuck with him. We eat about two and a half, um, two and a half meals a day, and um, so he we get the New York Times in paper um, every day, and so it's he reads part and I read part, and then we exchange. Uh, right outside of our house, there's a lane. And as all of you know, those of us in Portland get a lot of rain and there are puddles in the lane because it's not uh, well surfaced. This is our bedroom. Those of us, those of you who know me know that I'm a uh, great lover of things Asian. Uh, I collect Japanese prints, which is why my email is called Meiji Queen, because it's the Meiji period. But the uh, thing over the bed is actually an embroidery from China. We have a number of skylights in the house that we were lucky to have, but we didn't put them in. 
and I can tell what the day is like when I walk into the bathroom to brush my teeth. I don't know why it's doing that. Just a second. Oh, well, um, we're observant Jews. <laughs> and uh, once a year for Passover, I, uh, I shine all the silver cups because they go on the table. The little ones go on the table for the kids. And this is, um, it's called the cup of Elijah. It's the biggest cup. And at some point during the Passover service, we pass it along and everybody puts a couple of drops in into the large cup. Um, this is from my window, but there's my window. Uh, I'm sitting in my chair, I'm looking out the window and the apple trees are just uh, in my neighbor's yard, just beyond the and there they are. Uh, simply nearby. From my bedroom window looking out, we, we, ed, we live on the edge of the Markham Trail. So from my bedroom window, I look out onto essentially a gorge. And this is what happens in the street. And that's the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Carol, I have a comment. Yes. You know, I, so I've seen this. We talked about these before. So tonight I thought I would tell you my two favorites, which are the group of mirrors. The group of mirrors here. Because that reminds me that that's all about kind of the, the amazing juxtaposition, which reminds me of most of your work in some ways. And then the other one is of your unmade bed, which, you know, I just love the intimacy of that. I think that's a great photograph as well. So those are my two favorites from this group that I saw one other time. And, and we talked about them before, but those two are my favorites. Thank you. Um, the mirrors that, that you liked um, are from my favorite. We have a couple of bathrooms, but it's my favorite room in the house because it's my New York bathroom. I have a tin ceiling and I have a halfway up white subway tile and then this uh, rusty color and I have all small prints in that room. Nice. Thank you. Carol, one of the things I really appreciated about these photographs was they were kind of a, an intimate uh, look at your in environment and you kind of let yourself reveal a little bit about you through these photographs and you know having worked with you for a couple of years i really appreciate these photographs because they gave me an insight that i had not had before yes i thank you um i i don't do self portraits and I'm not terribly fond of the, the concept of, of people putting themselves in their picture, but I did, I did intentionally want to reveal myself to you. Um, yes, you're in every one of these pictures. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. Thank you. Hey, Carol? Uh, yes. It's, it's Walt. I just thought I'd say that I'd echo Giannis's comments and, and Peter's comments, uh, strongly echo those comments uh, because you have really revealed us uh, much of yourself here and, and I've, I enjoy it. The other thing is they're all color. I love it. I, you know, we, I see you so often in black and white and I just love your color. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I was a black and white photographer till I realized that I, that I could make red. And then I, I photographed in color for a very long time. And it was only perhaps in the last four years that I went to black and white because I wanted the photographs to, to relate to each other 
uh, in a particular way that black and white allows. If I threw a red photograph into this household group, it, it wouldn't work. I mean, in order, in order to use color in a group, they have to be harmonious with each other. Yes, mm -hmm. they, and they really nail it. Thank Carol, you. Carol I, I really enjoyed how you brought us uh, to your, your own world, both indoor and out, outdoors as well. Uh, I have to say, going back to my, uh, the favorite issue, I agree with Ray, uh, and I've seen this group before too at uh, a recent meeting. Uh, my favorite is one of Ray's too, the, the sheets, your bedroom inside. Um, I just love the light um, and just the folds of the sheets are just exquisite. This is such a beautiful image. And the other one I like a lot is another indoor shot with the, the ornate backed chair. Also just exquisite light. And both those images um, just give me, I mean, the image of your, your cups was very much part of your heritage, but these two images <laughs> give me a very old European feel. Um, everyone in Danielle's side came from Germany. Yeah, and I can tell. And uh, here after the war, but these these particular chairs were porch chairs. They're made of they're made of I think stainless steel, mm -hmm. and they were the chairs that were owned by a friend of mine who was moving away, and I inherited the chairs. And instead of having them be porch chairs, I put pink silk on them, and they became indoor chairs rather than outdoor chairs. But, but this curve uh, brings in the heritage from Daniel's family. Mm -hmm. Because his grandmother had these Wiedermeyer chairs in her house when um, in Germany before they came here. Mm -hmm. What part of Germany? Um, Daniel's father came from Aschaffenburg. Daniel's mother came from Berlin. But mm -hmm. that grandmother may have been born in Alsace. Alsace Lorraine area? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there are things called stumbling blocks that uh, are put in front of houses of either Holocaust survivors or oh, yeah. people who died. Mm -hmm. um, Danielle's Daniel's mother's household will be marked with a, with a, a mark. Um, we expect it in 2021. I've never been to Germany. He's been perhaps three times. Um, so that will be my first experience. That'll be wonderful. Carol? Yes. Oh, I love seeing these and they project beautifully. I have a question about the picture with Danielle. It looks like the flowers mm -hmm. from the tablecloth are moving into the photograph. Yes, the flowers are reading the times. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be sure. Is yeah. that some cool patient Photoshop work? Or? <laughs> yep. I really like it. But it took a second to go, whoa, what's going on here? Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I like it a lot too. There was too much distance between the flat tablecloth and the paper. So I moved the tablecloth into the paper. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's pretty artsy, but it works. Yeah, Thank very you. creative. Thank you. Carol, how did you choose these final images from the, the storehouse that I'm sure you've taken? Well, uh, part of it is um, they seem to go together. 
And what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, I come back. Um, there's a, a feeling of color that that I think flows into them. For example, I said if I had a red photograph, I really couldn't use it. But I must tell you, it's not finished. I mean, there are no kitchen utensils here. And those of you who know me know that I really like to cook. So I haven't hit the kitchen yet. No. That's why I asked, how did you choose these particular images? So it sounded like it was a, an intellectual kind of a decision about um, composition and color and that sort of thing. Well, I guess. As opposed to an emotional decision about, oh, this one makes me cry, this one. No. I'll, I'll tell you about the candlesticks though, because they're, they're special to me. I inherited the candlesticks from my friend, Sonia McDowell, who died about three years ago. Um, she had been president of the Dosen Council. She, she's very smart, very terrific woman. And um, I light candles on Friday night as is our Jewish tradition. And when I bring the clean candlesticks to the table and I say, as I lift up each one, let's go, Sonia. And so Sonia comes to the table with me for Shabbat dinner. And um, what you're seeing here, Daniel buys flowers every Friday afternoon when he buys uh, challah, which is a, a twisted bread. So we have the twisted bread and we have flowers and we have candles every Friday night. And so these, these are, I don't know what flower they are. You can probably tell me um, that had dropped its, its petals. See, this had an emotional uh, component that made you choose this one. Whereas some of the other ones had more of a uh, artistic or intellectual uh, reason for choosing those images. You know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I I feel like I'm really a very uh, emotional person. So, um, so I don't know. I, I think it's all woven together: the emotion and the intellect. Also, the color. The color, I think, is similar. It doesn't hit you in the eye, and it's not all paled out. There's a real continuity in the, in the color when you look from a distance at everything. Yeah. You know, those, those of you who know me well, they know that there's um, no sieve between my brain and my mouth. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty emotional person. So it's hard for me to answer. I mean, those of you who know me would know better whether these are emotional or whether they're mm -hmm. out of the head. Uh, Carol, you yeah. chose to make these all square format. Did you start out that way or arrive at it later? I think I had been thinking squares originally. Yeah, I uh, I started out as a kid with my my first camera was a Mamiya Flex, um, uh, a square format one twenty film square, and I think that um, it's just worked better for me. Carol? Yeah. I'm Mark Fitzgerald here. I thought you did a really wonderful job of sequencing these images in lo a lot of different ways. And uh, I have a lot of favorites. I haven't seen these before, but I think my favorite is number 17 with the glove. 
Oh, that's interesting. Do you think it's a good finish? I think it is. I mean, I thought it was a real good finish. It just kind of wrapped things up because we're we're all seeing stuff like this in the street more and more. And the, the colors are just perfect. Oh, thank you, Mark. Well, Carol, that's a really nice, uh, really nice set of work there. Um, thanks. Thanks very much for sharing that. Thank you for including me. Now I have to unshare this screen, right? Stop share. Perfect. Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. It took me, it took me months. <laughs> so, um, Susan, are you ready to be queued up? Um, I think so. Should I, I'll just go ahead and start this. Yeah, Susan's showing uh, images from her most recent stay in Papua New Guinea. Okay. Whoops. There we go. Oh, just a second. It didn't start on start on number one. Gotta go. Whoops, just a second. Okay. Um yeah, I Susan, have you shared your screen? Pardon? Are you sharing screen? Oh god, no, I didn't do that. Sorry. <laughs> Escape. Okay, so, oh heck. All right, just a second. Okay, so I go back here. Now I do screen share. Okay, sorry about that. It looked good to me. <laughs> okay, all right, back to keynote. Okay, now tell me, tell me if you can see this. Can everyone see it? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. This Down is at the bottom share screen. Yeah. Did, did, can you see it? No. no. No, you haven't shared your screen yet. Okay. And I've got something weird with Pat Welle coming up. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry about that. I did click it, I think. Hey, Doug, is there anybody in the waiting room? Okay. I'm what, clicking, uh, I clicked share screen. Thank you. Okay, what do you guys see? Uh, then you need to share. Not your work. I know, but. And it's I'm the getting, green share screen button I, at the bottom. I, I'm clicking that, share screen, green arrow. And you yeah. should get some options. And then share, and then share your application. Well, I get a, a something that says basic advanced and files. You don't see screen one or desktop one? Oh, I see desktop one. Okay. Just click that. Okay. All yeah. right. That's a new sense. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. I think that yes. was a new step because I change it every couple of days. Okay, let's get started. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, um, in 2019, I spent two months in Papua New Guinea. I hadn't been there in nine years. So uh, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I stayed mainly in urban areas. And um, it was the first time I ever shot digital in Papua New Guinea. So that was an experience in itself mainly a heck of a lot easier than carrying around film and all of that kind of stuff. And um, I felt that my success rate was higher than normal. Now I've been pondering if that's because digital made life easier. I didn't photograph, I didn't go there mainly to photograph. So I didn't photograph a heck of a lot. Or I was kind of wondering if maybe my standards have gone down or maybe my vision is expanding. But anyway, after the fun of deciding if an image worked better in black and white or color, I added quite a few new images to, to my um, black and white portfolio. So this is just a shot in downtown Port Moresby. Um, as elegant as Carol's photos are, 
These are probably a real different feel. This the, the smiling boy is one of my kids. He's taking uh, public transport to school. I stayed, I stayed with, um, well, we say relatives in a, in a slum area. This is just the back of a, a, a public, sort of a bus, but they're more like vans. This is um, close to the local market. Um, rather, rather rough and not pleasant. This is, the, this is the compound where I was staying. They're probably counting the kids, maybe 30 people living there. And this is just one of the, one of the houses. And, oh, and these are my kids. The three kids down below, are, they're all mine. Here are, here's an, another shot of the compound with the children playing cards. They, they managed to entertain themselves with very little. Um, one day I, I was trying to work in my room and I was disturbed. The boys were under the house uh, hunting rats. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a game that they played. Um, there's no trash service. So um, people just burn the trash every day. So, you know, this is typical. Uh, this is one of the loves of my life. This is Minnie, named after my mother. And she's, she's smart. This is her brother, Coleman. He was named after, after uh, an Australian man, the family knows. And this is Daisy Ann. She's one of the siblings, but by a different mother, same father, different mother. And she's, she's a pistol. I, I think she's destined to become the first woman prime minister. And this is a former prime minister, Sir Michael Samari. This is on their elementary school fence. Just, just, these are just shots around, around the city. This is um, a painting of a Highlands couple, probably from a place called Mendy, but probably not super accurate with a high rise in the background. Uh, this was painted on, on the wall of a bank in town. This is an Asaro Mudman. Just another, this is up in a town in the Highlands. Oh, I'm sorry, these are all urban pictures. Um, you've mainly seen my, um, um, uh, when I showed last February, it was all village and rural work. And um, I have one portfolio on my website is all urban work. Um, probably a pretty basic way to separate them, but it makes sense to me. Um, this is a kind of a local liquor dispensary. SP is South Pacific Lager. It's drinkable. Mm. This is in, in front of a, just a simple little store to buy you know, roots rice, powdered milk, you know, sugar, just some basics. And this is evening. The place where I stayed has intermittent electricity, but our hookup was illegal, which um, made it a little bit more intermi intermittent, it seemed. So those are the pictures. Susan, when you went on this trip, did you have, um, like what, what kind of goals or hopes or expectations did you have? And, and was, not, not just photographic. Oh, I was going there primarily to see people. I wanted to check up on everyone. There was a new batch of kids. Those children that I, that I showed you hadn't been born when I was there in 2010. So that was the main thing. I needed to check in with a couple of clients, one of them whom I had never even met. And um, 
but of course I had my camera with me. I even got a little um, XT30 with a pancake lens. And that was, that was always with me. You know, it was like almost like a little Leica. So I could cart that around wherever I went in the city. So I didn't go there primarily to photograph, but I knew I'd be in urban areas quite a bit most of the time. So um, I did try to do some. I think that vehicles um, tell an awful lot about place and about time. And, um, and people have, have great pride in vehicles. Uh, very often vehicles are cheaper than large homes and therefore people who don't have a terrible lot of money still invest in their vehicles as an extension of themselves. Uh, maybe. Basically in Papua New Guinea, very few individuals have, have their own vehicle. I mean, it's more now as, as there is money coming into the country, but um, I don't get that sense so much as maybe other places. Um, this guy, I don't know, this could well not be his vehicle. You know, he might just be relaxing there. And people travel around mainly on these vans. They're like 23 seater vans. Or in, when you get out in the country, it's mainly, or a lot on the back of trucks. So. So Susan, you say you haven't been there for what, nine years? Yeah. Like what were like your first one or two impressions after nine years of not having been in this uh, urban area? It sounds like you didn't get much out into the, uh, the more rural areas. I, I spent three weeks in the countryside. But I was also very sick. I was sick three times, including with typhoid. So that somewhat limited what I could do because I was like, you know, flat on my back with typhoid fever. So um, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what were I'm, your impressions, you know, like your oh, first and second impressions after nine years? Uh, what did you see as changes? Um, you know, like from a fresh perspective after nine years? Mainly, I couldn't believe the press of people. You know, when I first saw Port Moresby in 1982, it was kind of a quiet little backwater. Now it's just nuts. There are traffic jams, there are people everywhere, and there's been a lot of building, mainly by Chinese, and I'm not gonna get into the politics. <laughs> you know, half finished ugly buildings, um, it, it was not nearly as pleasant as it had been. <clears throat> you know, there was like more money around, but people seemed poor, <clears throat> which is kind of a third world thing. I don't know, maybe here as well. Has the population exploded there? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's uh, about two and a half about three times what it was when I first arrived in 1980. And that makes a huge difference. Um, and there's mass migration to the urban areas. So in some cases, the, the countryside villages can be quieter than they were. Um, yeah, the people are going to the urban areas. So um, it was not I have to say that the first years I was there, it was pretty magical. I wouldn't use that word anymore, but I have close ties. Has there been significant climate change in 10 years? I, I don't notice that. I mean, I, mean um, I wasn't aware of it. You know, here we're, we're having a, an exceptionally warm winter. We hear about climate change all the time. I'm just kind of um, don't know. But don't isn't there a lot of um, uh, what do we call wetlands uh, in the lower part of Papua New Guinea? Yeah, I spent three years in a in a huge huge swamp wetlands. Um, 
And I do want to say there are stories about the islands, and I've been to some of the small islands that are being inundated with salt water, you know, to the point where the water table is so high that they can no longer plant. Yeah. So that is one consequence. But also, mm -hmm. some of the islands actually sink. So you, you might end up with a double whammy. Yeah, Susan? Yes. I, uh, I really love your images. And um, I guess what strikes me about them first is that you know the people, you know the place, and you're not being targeted as somebody with a camera that uh, you know is soliciting photographs. You're kind of just blending in with uh, the landscape and, and the people of the area. And um, I think you just get a, a real feel for what the place is like with that attitude. Well, I hope so. I've spent about 20 years there, but I don't think I ever blend in. But, <laughs> you know, so I try, just try to use that to my advantage. One of the challenges is, um, is people want their pictures taken. So sometimes, you know, it's, it, it can be a little bit hard to not take pictures. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine digital helps that way. You don't, you're not uh, taking film that, you know, you don't, you might not be able to replace. Oh, th yes, it's, it's, digital's amazing, I have to say. So um, we're, we're approaching eight o'clock and it's time for Mark. Thank you, Susan. That that's um, really a very nice uh, presentation. Well, thank you for looking at urban work. <laughs> Doug. Hello. Yes. Yes, it's Andy. Um, can I make a suggestion that you mute everybody so that uh, Mark's presentation isn't interrupted by telephone calls and whatever? I and people can use their space bar when they want to talk. Yes, that's a good idea. And I, um, can someone tell me quickly how to do that? When well, the... Susan first needs to un unshare. Yeah, now, how do I do that? Find the green box again, Susan, and click oh. unshare. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> the box. You can do it for her, Doug. Oh, I can? Oh, okay. I see. It's new Stop share. You are screen sharing, stop share. Red button, stop, right, cool, yeah. thank you. <laughs> okay. I swear they've changed it since the last time I did a screen, screen share. So um, real quickly, I'm gonna let, uh, before we move on uh, for Mark's presentation, Ray, I'm gonna let you go ahead with your quick announcement. Oh, sorry, I don't wanna delay. Um, for those of you who attend the Brown Bag for the Portland Art Museum, uh, it's usually the third Wednesday of the month, which is going to be on Inauguration Day. So we've postponed it one week. Uh, if you'd like to join us, it's the 27th. And uh, this month we're going to be having Kate Miller Wilson, who's a woman who photographs primarily her autistic son. Uh, she's really a terrific photographer. And I'll put a link, in case you're not a brown bag person or a museum subscriber, I'll put a link in the chats. And you're all welcome to come join us. It's a webinar. 12 o'clock noon, Wednesday 27th. Okay, great. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, Doug. Um, so someone tell me, please, how do I mute the whole group once Mark gets going? Or do we want to just go with everybody, please self-mute? So yeah. we can ask if you. Go, if, if you go I, to can even, I can even do that. So if you go to the participants, you should be able to mute each person. Okay. I'm not. I'm not going to be too bothered. So, uh, so okay. I think it'll be. So it, it, it'll. It'll be okay. okay. I'm going to be distracted in other ways. I'm sure. Let's let's start then by please everyone check their mute microphone button on the far lower left and go ahead and mute yourself unless uh, you're going to be asking a question and let's see if that works out. Um, so let's get on to um, Mark's presentation and Mark. Um, am I pronouncing your name correctly if I say Kurgle? Is that oh, that's close? actually very good, yes. 
Kurgle. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. So my my two years of German uh, paid off. Great. <laughs> they did. <laughs> so um, we're really lucky to have Mark with us. He's coming to us from Germany. So it's what five a.m. there or something. By now, yes, it's five a.m. And so we're really we're really uh, appreciative of you doing this for us. Um, Mark is an award-winning fine art black and white photographer. Uh, he's a writer, he's an educator, and he's a director of Vancouver Photo Workshops. And I guess that's, is that still the case, even though you're in Germany? Yeah, yeah, I'm still, I'm still running, uh, I'm still keeping the business uh, in, in Vancouver. I'm still running workshops, um, even though the name obviously has to be changed. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's something that will happen. But, uh, but as it is right now, um, it's still, it's still um, in operation and I continue, and I, uh, plan to continue to do so as well. Okay. So, um, and then I, I also want to just mention that his long exposure landscapes um, are, are beautiful. He also has done nudes and architectural photographs, and he's been widely exhibited and won numerous international awards. His images have appeared in Outdoor Photographer and other photography magazines. Um, he was originally born in Germany and now back there but he came to Canada in 1996 to uh, earn an economics degree and has been seriously involved in photography ever since he was given his father's camera and darkroom set up at the age of 12. Um, and so you can learn more about uh, Mark Kurgle photography at markkurgle.com. So with that, um, Mark, I'll let you get started. And then one, one quick question, do you want to take questions as you go along or would you prefer people hold them until the end? Uh, I'm actually okay with questions uh, while I go along because uh, that way people don't forget. Okay. So, so don't worry about, you know, don't, I mean, you could, uh, I mean, if it gets too crazy, I mean, maybe at some point I might say, okay, hold a question if it's not appropriate, uh, maybe at that time. But, uh, but I think in general, I'm, I'm all for spontaneity. And if you have something then it probably makes sense to uh, to ask it right there. Okay, great. Uh, it's all yours. Okay, good. Well, uh, well. First of all, before I start my screen share here, I wanted to uh, thank all of you guys, but of course, in particular, uh, Susan and then uh, you, Duck, for uh, for setting this up. Um, and of course, I have to uh, thank Andy. Um, um, for initially bringing up uh, this and. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, throwing out the idea of doing this. And I think it is just every time I do one of these, I think I'm just amazed at the technology and the ability. I mean, now I'm in Germany, but, you know, even if I was in Vancouver, it's just great that, uh, that even though we're, you know, facing all these challenges these days, I think this is one of the positives that, for me anyway, uh, comes from, uh, from this situation, that, uh, that now uh, we kind of had to learn how to, use this technology it's been there before and i've actually been using it for a while i've been running online courses for over 10 years but not to this extent and to this depth and i think uh, uh you know and certainly these live events i think are just wonderful so um i thank you guys all for for doing this and giving me the opportunity uh to share some of my work so uh let's get this going uh, 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 that should be good. All right. So hopefully you see this now. Yep. That's good. All right. So far, so good. Whoops. Let's go back one. Um, all right. So I've been actually thinking about this title for just uh, for, for quite a while. And, um, you know, because when I was talking with Susan about this, I was, I was thinking about, all right, let's, let's put something together that is um, a, a little bit about my photographic journey, about some lessons, lessons that I learned along the way, but also a bit about uh, the development of my photography, my vision, and actually also my personality, because I think that is all interconnected. And we actually saw that, I think, very well in all of the presentations tonight. Um, I, I, I'm always amazed at how much you can tell about a person that you don't know by looking at their photographs, right? His, his or her photographs. Um, and so I'm trying to do a little bit of that here too. 
And I remember one of my big uh, icons, one of the big role models in photography early on when I was a student was a photographer by the name of Ralph Gibson, um, New, York, New York photographer. And, uh, and he um, started one of his workshops by saying that he, he tries to keep on his toes and tries to keep fresh by realizing that he's only as good as his next, photo uh, as his next photograph. So that's why I made this uh, my presentation. But, you know, as a little uh, very brief introduction here, and I'm gonna expand on these, of course, as I go through it, um, you know, I'm, I'm amazed if you ask, I ask my students why they photograph. And I'm amazed of how many people can't really answer that question. Um, so I try to answer it right here for myself. I've also, uh, I have of course thought about this a, a great deal and I think it's important that everyone think about this. You know, why do you photograph? What is it that excites you about photography? So for me, it's of course to exercise creativity. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you can do and, and try something different. Uh, of course, it's also the old stigma that, you know, I, I, I almost failed like one of my worst course in high school was art class, um, you know, just drawing just didn't sit with me. Um, here, here comes a medium that is just comfortable for me, which was photography. And I think once you become comfortable with it, then you also uh, can start to uh, use that to exercise your creativity. Um, but uh, over the last, well, especially the last uh, five years or so, the part of having life experiences and create memories has actually become the most important reason for me to do photography. And this is something that dates back to um, a conversation I had with another mentor, a uh, personal mentor of my photography uh, that I've had when I was a student and I would show him my work and ask for critique. And then uh, he would always provide his thoughts and it was very helpful for me. And at some point I was like, you know, Ian, I wanna see some of your work. You never show you know, any of your work, I would love to see it. And he says, well, there's a reason I don't show it to you because I don't think it's very important. I basically discard it. And I said, well, why would you do that? And he said, well, you know, once I've made the photograph, I've had the experience. The photograph itself isn't really worth a lot. And to me, that was a very novel concept at the time. Now I get to actually understand it a little bit. I'm starting to understand it because I think the journey that it took you to create the photograph is very important and you should enjoy it, hopefully. Now, what do I photograph? Well, predominantly landscapes and architecture. And uh, if there is a bit of a style for me, then I think it is that I, that I do this together because I don't really go and, and do architecture in urban scenes very much and urban surroundings. I do, but it's certainly not what I enjoy the most. And in landscapes, I do sort of landscape that is just a landscape, but I do love to have a structure in the landscape. So I guess a touch of man somewhere included. And the how part is sort of the least interesting for me, but, uh, but it is worth pointing out that I have a camera that shoots only black and white um, digital. Uh, and uh, I have been really enjoying it for the biggest reason that I skip completely the, the, the color to black and white conversion. And I feel like here I'm using a tool that actually gets me closer to my end result. So I can cut out uh, a few steps in between. Leica makes these kind of cameras too, the Leica monochromes, you know, a digital camera that your raw file essentially is already black and white. Now, if you uh, go kind of back about 15 years, I've, I've been seriously pursuing photography since 2004. Um, so, so that's, well, that's actually coming on to about 17 years already, but, you know, you look at, at this work and, and this is something else that Ralph Gibson mentioned to me early on. He said that photographic style is something that you discover. It's not something that you set out to have. And now that I look back, even at that, you know, granted fairly brief period of about 15 years, I'm also starting to realize once again that he was right. Um, because when I look at this, this is quite representational. Um, certainly the photograph on the left, this was the one of the first trips I did to the Canadian prairies. So this was in, actually, I think this was in Saskatchewan, province of Saskatchewan. 
um, and I went through Alberta and and I haven't done too much Manitoba. So most of my my kind of Canadian prairies, which I'll show you a lot more work of, um, has been done in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And these grain elevators were sort of the first thing that really fascinated me. I didn't know anything about it. I've been, you know, was raised in Germany in a, in a rather big city, Hamburg, you know, comparable to Portland, uh, maybe even a little bit bigger. Uh, and then, you know, I moved to uh, Vancouver. So that's also a pretty big city too. Uh, so going to the prairies and having this like flat land with really little on it, these grain elevators did a great job of standing out. So they were sort of easy targets. Now I know that now back then I just thought, hey, there's something I can photograph, right? And I got into long exposure and it just really fascinated me. And I think now looking back, one of the things that, 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 I think kept me going with it is because the long exposure part of this made this image a little bit less real. Like it took some reality out of it, which I wasn't quite ready to do with my composition yet. I was still doing, you know, fairly, you know, camera level on tripod, you know, not, not too creative from that point of view. So the long exposure introduced that, that kind of level of abstraction from reality. And you know, when you then look at the photograph on the right, that was actually a very important photograph that I took early on. And believe it or not, it took me about 10 visits to this place until I finally thought, I can actually, you know, I can, I can tilt my camera, like it doesn't have to be level, right? And, uh, and it's so funny because I see that now too. I see, like I'll go with a group. I mean, I haven't done that now in a while, of course, but I'd go in with a, with a group of students somewhere and everyone would set up their tripod, they would set it up at eye height and they would level it. And then they start, right? And once you start like that, it's very hard to put the legs down to the ground, for example, or it's very hard to now start to take the camera and sort of de-level it. I don't think that's a word, but you know what I mean, right? So it did take me that long. And when I looked at this, I thought, you know, that's wrong in terms of what I learned about proper composition, but it works. So it was, it was an important photograph. And then I come to the work I do more recently. And the, uh, the two photographs um, on the, uh, the, the, the two four by five photographs on the left are, um, are really um, sort of my first foray into, uh, uh, into just some, some intentional camera movements really, um, where, uh, where what I'm doing is doing about a 30 second exposure and I'm shifting the lens, you know, as that 30 second exposure is happening. And what I'm, get, what I'm getting in the end is, uh, is a somewhat um, uh, less representational image um, I love the one, the, the one in the middle, actually, I did uh, initially with this technique. That was one of my first attempts at this, uh, and I liked it a lot. And then the one on the left was the one I did on my recent trip to Iceland. Um, actually, this uh, past summer, I was, I was able to go to Iceland twice when the pandemic sort of eased up a little bit. And, and from Germany, at least, uh, travel restrictions were lifted. And it was quite easy for me to... Uh, to get to Iceland, so of course I, I took advantage because I was, I was, I was itching to get kind of back out there. Um, and you know, this is just like a, a dinky waterfall that you probably otherwise wouldn't really photograph it. Um, but in this way, it it to me the best way I can describe it, it, it starts to become a little bit like a memory, right? It's something where you remember that you've been to a waterfall, but you may not remember the exact details. And you certainly won't remember as time goes on and those memories fade, right? You still remember some things about it. And I feel like this is, this is approaching it. And then the photograph on the right um, is, um, is something that I'm striving to now, which is uh, to kind of let go of the subject matter. Right, it's 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 yes, it's a photograph of a tree, and I'll show you another photograph of that same tree later on, and then I come back to this, and I think then it might be easier to under to understand. But this photograph isn't about the tree, so it is different than my initial photograph that I just showed you of the grain elevator, which is focused all on the subject matter of the grain elevator, right? Um, and 
and I'm trying to work more towards the photograph on the right these days. So Mark, can I ask you a quick question? Of course. Does your current camera shoot square pictures, the digital one? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, that's a good question. But uh, what I really enjoy, it shoots in four by three aspect ratio, right? So it's kind of like Olympus did this too with the micro four thirds system, right? So, so the, the sensor is a little bit more square compared to you know, your, your standard uh, 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 DSLR or mirrorless camera. Right. Sure. So it's a little bit easier to get to the square. But, uh, you know, I heard that question earlier, too. Like the square is something, you know, that uh, that I'm going to come back to here because, hey, it's not my dark room, but it's a really great dark room picture. <laughs> the point here was that I started photography. Luckily, I'm, I'm sort of I'm old enough that I that I just got to enjoy the tail end of film. Right. And I'm really thankful for that, because once again, I don't think I would. I maybe wouldn't have gotten into black and white in such a big way these days, but back then I did get into black and white because that was available to me, right? And that's your answer also to the square picture because one of the cameras I used to have as a, like a film camera was a Roly SL66. So that was a square medium format. So I started shooting with the square and not necessarily by choice, but because I inherited this great camera and I was like, wow, this is, you know, initially I thought about selling it because I was like, this is above my pay grade, but you know, now I have it. So, so let's just use it. So I had to sort of learn how to work with the square. And I also discovered my love for it. And if I hadn't done that, you know, maybe once again, it would have been harder to discover that because I see that today again with digital cameras, most of them shoot in two by three and it's easier, it's easier than ever to crop, but people don't do it, right? Or they don't, yeah. I mean, it's not that they don't do it at all, but they don't, it's, it seems like a challenge, right? Because we accept initially what, we, what we're presented with, right? And we accept that as a norm. And that was the great thing with film that every camera, I wanna say, every camera had a character and had a soul and had a you know, way that you, that you worked it because it had a lot of shortcomings and you sort of had to, find your way around it. And then these days, we all want to buy, like it's certainly in marketing, you know, we're all being sold the one camera that does everything, right? But you have that one camera that does everything. It ends up, I mean, it's actually still pretty decent at everything these days because of the technology. But I still think that having some limitations can, can, can really get you in a certain area, right? Can really... Uh, make you discover certain aspects of photography and actually make you creative too, like can help you be creative because you have no choice, right? So I think the square comes all the way from back here. And of course, you know, today I'm, one other thing that I kept from, uh, from you know, loving film was that uh, I still love to print. So, you know, if, if anything, that hasn't really changed in my journey. It's just that uh, now I am embracing digital and I'm printing digitally. And I love it because as far as I'm concerned, the photograph isn't finished until it's printed. Um, and I even go as far as print it and then go back and edit it. Because what I see on screen, you know, is okay, but it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't translate on the print. And once you look at a print, you might say, okay, I need to go back and for example, dodge and burn maybe these certain areas a little bit more based on what the print look like. And that gives you a different insight than just looking on screen, right? And I don't, I'm not even saying that everybody should go out and get their own printer because it is a big uh, learning curve, but even going and finding a lab, you know, and uh, that's decent, you know, I mean, even Costco, I guess, before you're not going to print anything, I'm even okay with Costco. Um, but, uh, but, you know, even finding something that's a little bit better, a little bit re more repeatable, uh, predictable, and just keep going back and getting prints made, I think you're going to get such a better insight into your own work that way. So I've been, I've been enjoying that. And then because everybody always asks, I do have this one text slide in here on, on black and white. So once again, you know, why did I do it? Well, it's because, because that's how I started. You know, having a, a color darkroom set up at home, it was much more complicated. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to say it was impossible, but it was certainly more complicated and a lot more expensive. So at the time, black and white was amazing. And it really, 
even like kept me out of trouble too, because I got into it, you know, like when I, like in my early teenage years, you know, other people, uh, other my friends would go out and I'd have, I'd usually have one friend or another with me, but you know, we'd be in the dark room all night and just trying printing. And, and it was just a, a, a I have very fond memories of that time, it was awesome. Um, and then I mentioned before that I feel that long exposure is a step of abstraction from reality, while black and white is too, right? Just because we don't see in black and white. And I've always enjoyed that. I was never interested in, um, in documenting reality. Um, or maybe I shouldn't say that I wasn't interested in it. I was, I was more excited in, uh, in doing something that, that I see. And, and I didn't feel that documenting reality and keeping everything exactly how I saw it was an important factor there. Um, and that doesn't mean I, you know, that I don't appreciate that kind of work. I think there's incredible photographers that, you know, that are photojournalists. Um, it's just not something for me. Um, the next point is I believe that, that black and white allows for further editing compared to color kind of goes with the last point I made as well. And what I mean by that is that because we don't see the world in black and white, I think we have less, um, less preconceptions. Like we don't, we don't really have any expectations as much as we do with, with color. So, so uh, as a simple example, you know, if, you, if you show a photograph with uh, uh, red grass, then, uh, then it's gonna be very easy for people to think, okay, you must've done some Photoshop here, or you know, initially like we would notice that. People would look at the red grass and, and wonder like what's going on and why you did that. Um, but in black and white, I mean, I can turn the sky black even though it was white. I can, I can do black snow, right? It's because we don't really have the reference. And even if an image looks like it's obviously been touched and worked on, I think we have more tolerance for it because again, it's that black and white medium that, that takes you away from reality. So therefore you can venture and, and, and try something that maybe isn't quite so true to what the, what the scene really was like. Uh, you know, timeless, simple and beautiful, of course that's, that's open to interpretation, but that's how I feel. And then, um, you know, uh, it's what I like and inspires me. I think that's actually a really important point. And, uh, you know, I was listening to an interview with uh, Gregory Crutzen. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but, but he's, an, he's an interesting character, very, very good accomplished photographer. And he, in that interview, he said, well, he, he said that he thinks every artist has one central story to tell. And then you know, they, the interviewer asked him a little bit more and, you know, they expanded on that. And at some point he said, well, he feels that way partly because once you're at a certain age, you just, uh, you know what you like, right? So like in your late teens, early twenties, you're gung ho to try a bunch of different things, right? You're going to do this, you're going to do something else completely different and, uh, and you're going to get uncomfortable and you're doing something you know, that, that you've never thought you would three months earlier. And, uh, and that's okay, right? There's, there's that openness, right? But, uh, but once you're, I mean, I'm even feeling that now, I feel like even though I don't consider myself old, but, you know, I now, I have a pretty good idea what I like. And so I'm seeking, uh, I'm seeking uh, life experiences that, that go in alignment with what my preferences are, right? And I think that's absolutely right. You shouldn't have to apologize for that. You know, I think that uh, in that sense, uh, Crutzen is absolutely right. So for me, I like black and white. It doesn't mean that, I, that I'm never going to try color. In fact, I, I shot some color this, uh, this past year. Um, but it certainly means that I don't stress myself of sort of being only, quote unquote, a black and white photographer, right? I'll, I'll try to embrace it. So I have um, quite a bit of work here now. Um, and I want to show you a little bit the progression, a little more on the progression. I started out on that, um, but here's some examples of the, the early work I've done on the prairies. And uh, actually the one on the left is the very first one I took. Um, that's the one that started this series. And that's also a very important image because 
uh, it also demonstrated to me the importance of working in a series, you know, when you're a photographer. Uh, you know, I, I drove out to this ghost town that was Dorothy, Alberta. This is close to Calgary um, in Drumheller, actually close to Drumheller. And I uh, and and somebody I just drove there because somebody said, "Hey, you should go to this ghost town." I thought, "Well, ghost town sounds interesting. I'll go." But that was my point of departure. You know, it was just like I don't even know what images to make, but ghost town sounds interesting. So let's let's go. And then the ghost town there is actually pretty disappointing. So, you know, I went and I was like, "Well, this is not." I, I think I did make two or three other pictures, but I wasn't feeling overly inspired. And then on the way on the way out, I noticed this grand elevator. And as I said earlier, I had never seen them. And I thought, well, this is the most interesting subject matter right here. And I took this photograph and then subsequently started looking into grand elevators and their history and, and try to learn a little bit about them. And this is another thing I love about photography that, uh, that you know, you, you discover a subject matter, then you have an opportunity to learn about that. And if it wasn't for photography, I would have never learned about this part of Canadian heritage, or not just Canadian heritage, but um, but grain elevators and uh, and the whole industry behind it, and the importance for these rural areas of uh, of of these grain bins and everything that goes with it, and the variety of architecture that goes along with it. So the one on the right, they're just uh, they're called grain bins. They're they're just smaller depositories. Um, and, uh, and once again, I think this was an image, even when I took it, there was something about it that, um, that made me, that, that sort of made me appreciate it more, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Why? Um, and of course, you know, I love the negative space. Um, but, you know, now looking back at it, I think that the big difference to the one on the left is of course that here now I'm picking up this pattern. And, and I've been actually back to, to that location several times and now they're gone. And that's part of the prairie too, of course, that you know, these things change. And this grand elevator on the, on the left here is still standing, but the roof uh, has been taken off in a storm. So you know, it's not gonna take that much longer, I think, and it's gonna be gone. Um, so that's, that's interesting too. And you see here some more work. You saw the one on the right already. Um, this was another nice one, you know, I drove by this one and I really felt like I wanted to go home. You know, it was like at the end of a long day uh, and you do spend a lot of time in the car when you do this kind of stuff because you just, I mean, the prayer just go on forever, those roads. And I was just ready to go to the hotel and, and, and crash and relax. And, uh, and, it, and it had rained. So I almost felt like, okay, great. It's like raining like cats and dogs. I don't have to feel bad if I'm, if I'm done photographing for the day. And I drove by these two and I thought, okay, hold on, I'm gonna turn around and photograph these. And in hindsight, I'm so glad that I did. Um, and, and it's basically now one of the, the, the things that I really appreciate about this landscape too, is that, uh, is that you can truly be open to being inspired, right? I mean, of course, in the back of my mind, I know what I'm, what I'm looking for, but literally you just turn down the road and you may not run into anything worth photographing for a couple hours, but then you never know something might just happen. And I love reacting in, in the moment as well. So now these, you're cropping these or uh, what? Yeah, these are all cropped. Crop. Yeah, yeah, these are all, well, this one actually is a panorama. So at the time, because it's an older image. Uh, so at the time I was, uh, I was shooting with a 12 megapixel. I think this one is on the D3 like a Nikon D3 and, uh, and I was starting to get some traction with this and people were asking me for bigger prints. And you know, if you, if you take a, a, a two by three aspect ratio, 12 megapixel, you're not gonna be able to make a really big print of that, right? By the time you crop it to, this is a double square, right? Or a two to, two to one aspect ratio. So I started, uh, I started doing panoramas, so multiple shots and then merge it to you know, be able to actually do larger prints quite cumbersome. Uh, I don't do that anymore. I don't think you really need, anybody really needs to do that anymore because now we have plenty megapixel available on most cameras. Um, but, uh, but the double square was sort of the next format that I fell in love with after, um, after the square. And you know, that's why I'm calling it double square because it really is, right? Just two squares next to each other. 
And so I, I did quite a bit of work in that. As so Mark, are these before or after the war memorials? Uh, these are before the war memorials. So these, these, uh, and I don't unfortunately have any of that work here, but you can go to my website and see that um, because I thought, hey, 60 minutes, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta cut myself. I gotta, I gotta be uh, comprehensive here. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, these, these informed the work. And I think once you see these, it makes sense that I did the war memorials the way that I did. Totally, that's why I asked. Right, yeah, good question, yeah. So this, this is, and I mean, I'm sort of coming back to this today as well. I'll show you that as well. Like I'm coming, there is still something about this more documentary approach, I would feel, I, I would call this, right? It's more like, hey, here's the, here's the structure in the landscape. Right, and I'm not really photoshopping anything um, on this, you know. Like I'm even leaving like fences in there. Uh, I mean, here or there, I might take out a power line, but most of the time, even that, I leave in there. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the prairie is like they're so sparse and so kind of minimal that you really, you know, if there is something small in there, it's usually not very much that you have to take out. Right, that's the beauty of it. And Mark, uh, you uh, mentioned these are that previous shot is a long exposure. Uh, how long? Yes. What was the time, exposure time? Well, uh, this one here is about, uh, if I remember correctly, this is about eight minutes. Eight minutes. Um, eight minutes, yeah. So most of the long exposures that, uh, that, that I've done are, you know, anywhere, well, the great majority is eight minutes and below. So basically from, uh, from usually about 30 seconds to eight minutes. And then there's a few that are longer. Uh, and I, I think I actually, I do have an example of it later on that I can show you. So I've done uh, up to two hours. Wow. Um, and then the, uh, it looks like there's vignetting on this. Was that in post or? Yes, or that, that, was, that, that, that was in post. Yeah, yeah. I always, I, I, I love vignetting. <laughs> I mean, I've done, I'm doing less of it these days, um, but you also notice that that's why I'm showing you these two. These are kind of dark. And now I'm gonna show you some more higher key. Like at this time, I really loved um, these dramatic contrasty, right? Of course, I'm also gone in and done a lot of dodging and burning, like on the front of the grand elevator, for example, right? Bringing out certain elements. Um, I mean, really nothing that you wouldn't do in the dark room. Right. Right. I mean, this is not, uh, these are not overly complicated uh, in terms of the processing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but what I did enjoy even early on was that, you know, I, I spent, I spent quite a bit of time in the dark room enough to know how much more time I would have to spend to get to the level that I really wanted to get at. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's been another amazing thing about digital that, uh, uh, that it, is, um, it is much quicker to get to really, really good results, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not talking about, um, what's that one called? Like that software now that one click and you change your sky and you got the sunset and you got the, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, um, some really uh, meaningful changes, they might be small, but you know you can get there within a few years, right? While, I, you know, in the dark room, I mean, you can be doing this all your life, um, and then you also still, and you also need certain. Uh, uh, I think you need some skills for that in terms of like motor skills. You know how to move the, uh, how to move your dodging and burning tools and and things like that. That uh, that are just, you know, I think that are just really hard to obtain. Right, and uh, and so this is this has been amazing for digital, uh, that uh, that you know the, the 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 sort of barrier I think has has really gone has really been decreased, right? And sometimes to the point though that uh, that people uh, don't actually pay enough attention anymore, and that's that's a that's a very I mean that's a temptation every day, right? Mm -hmm. Because you look at your digital image and you might say, well, this is great, I'll put it out there. And, and, you know, just, just because it's, it looks very good, very quickly, doesn't mean you should still not have a very discerning eye mm -hmm. when you go over absolutely every detail and make sure that it is really that good. And you might need less adjustments, but those tiny adjustments are really very important. 
-hmm. Yeah, I like what you say. Uh, so the contrast is exquisite here, and I don't. I'm not. I have never shot film, but I've seen a few film. Uh, you know, plenty of film images, and this looks very much like film to me. I would never have known it was digital. Mm. Well, thank you. And I, the I, picture. I just... The picture before this one, I was curious about with the twin silos. Mm -hmm. That uh, that is, uh, it has that very, I don't know. I want to say the Hudson River School look, that kind of mm -hmm. Orton effect, which is lovely. Is that's a long exposure too? Is it? It is. Yes. This is a bit shorter. I think this was only about thirty seconds or so. Mm -hmm. Right, of course, it kind of depends on how quickly the, the, the clouds are moving and everything. Sure. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but this one, and, and I'm happy that I did because if you, with a lot of skies, like this sky kind of moves horizontal, right? So the clouds are kind of moving horizontally. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go very long, it, it, that, that usually just kind of takes a lot of the, the dynamism out of a, out of a picture. <clears throat> so I think in other words, to compare to this, Mm -hmm. You know, what makes this, I think, to me, more successful is the fact that the clouds are kind of a bit of a, a, bit of a diagonal line, you know, and they sort of yes. originate from this. Uh, I mean, they, they don't originate from behind the grain elevator, um, but, uh, but they sort of, they have a point of origin and then sort of, you know, they go across the frame, uh, which I think is, is, is more interesting. If I had done this one for eight minutes, it would have just... <laughs> kind of uh, uh, muddled the sky a little bit. Yeah, like, I see it, I see it. You know? Mm -hmm. very, so very I think that, uh, uh, and you know, and part of why I did this shorter uh, was also because I really still did want to get home. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, and I was, and I was setting up on the middle of the highway too, but there was just no traffic. Um, I like I was pulled over on the side of the highway. There was no way to really, there was no parking area or something. So you sort of in a, you know, sometimes with this, you're in a little bit of a precarious situation because you can really only pull over. And if the big trucks come, uh, it, it can be a little, little scary. But luckily, you know, these roads, there's not all that much traffic. Mark, how did you discover or, or was it like by <clears throat> accident or discovery or like the long exposure idea? Uh, oh, I can tell you that. Um, Michael Kenner, basically. Right, I think that uh, anybody that's, I, I, yeah, I would say anybody that does any long exposure with, uh, you know, with, 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 with any kind of uh, uh, vigor uh, must have done so because they saw Michael Kenner's work. You know, I mean, these days, I actually don't look at that many photographers' work. Um, and uh, I always try to actually make time to do that because I do think it's I do think it's really important. But back then, um, you know, I discovered Michael Kenner when I was uh, in photography school, which I did after uh, university. And uh, and I just you know when I saw his work, I was just like, wow, I want to do images like that. I want to photograph like he does. And he actually didn't use long exposure for everything, but of course, to my eye, it looked like it was all long exposure. Right, and so uh, together with a friend, uh, we decided, okay, let's just take a month and let's try to figure out Michael Kenna style. Um, and you know, it, it, I can tell you already that uh, that you can't figure that out in a month. <laughs> but uh, but we were young and thought, okay, sure, we, we can we can figure this out. Um, but it just kind of set me on on a path back then, and uh, and I I still enjoy it today. I still I still do it uh, today. But until about three years ago. Uh, I probably did uh, at least 95% of my images long exposure. Like it was, it was almost a, a default. It was almost like part of my checklist. You know, when you get the camera ready to set up, do a long exposure. Like it, I didn't even think about it at some point anymore. It was, it was, that's just what I did. Um, and of course there's others that I looked up at, um, but, uh, but you know, there's a, there's a, a, a photograph of a, of a tree that I usually show in my long exposure class that Michael Kenna did. And, uh, and it's, it's basically a tree in, in just a, a bed of white, right? In a bed of negative space. And my photography school was very technical focused, right? So it was, it was just a 10 month program. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so within those 10 months, uh, it, it was a commercial photography program. So we were all taught about 
this is how you should do photography. And it was all technical and the chart, the sharpest image, the most tonal range, uh, the best lenses, the best, uh, the best print with the most tonal range and all of that kind of stuff. And of course, level the tripod and all of that too. And when I saw Kenneth's work, you know, I was like, wow, this is like the exact opposite of, of what I was just taught, you know, for 10 months, because it was so minimal, uh, yet it worked. And it probably wasn't even super sharp either. And yet it worked. Right. And so there was there was something that I like, there was a feeling that I got when I looked at those photos. And I thought, and that feeling was that I wanted to go there. I wanted to see that scene. And I wanted to experience that. I wanted to experience what he experienced when I when he was there making that photograph. So uh, so that's what I was chasing after, and I didn't really know how to get to it, other than I think he was doing long exposure. So let's try that, right? And then my initial photographs looked quite different, of course, because you know I it just then became my own journey to try to to do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if, you're, if anybody's not familiar with him, um, I can uh, put him in the, Kenna is K-E-E-N-A, Michael Kenna. Oh, sorry, is it? Actually, it's double N-A, K-E-N-N-A, I think it is. K-E-N-N-A. Yeah, 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 sorry. So, uh, so this is something, I almost want to call this kind of my intermediate stage on the prairie now, where, um, you know, I'm still looking at the subject matter here, but I'm actually expanding. I'm going away from uh, just the grain elevators and, and grain bins, and I'm looking at what else is around. And, uh, and this was also mostly inspired by, uh, by a good friend of mine that, I, that I've been teaching work, workshops with on the prairie, Oliver Dutre. And, and you know, we started taking people to, uh, to these locations. So that's one of the things that, that's one of the ways that, uh, that I met Andy um, as well, originally. And, you know, I started looking at these other structures and I mean, this one is an abandoned church and I tried to play with what else can I do? And this one is actually an infrared capture. So the, the, the foliage in the front is, uh, is much brightened because of the, the infrared capture. And then, of course, I still had to brighten it up a little bit more, but uh, but it it gave me a very different look than as if, you know, you would just take a a, a quote unquote straight black and white photograph of the, of this. And I did a little bit more with that. You know, so you see here again the field and the foreground is really quite light, you know, because of the the infrared. But what it does is it it helps you to it helps isolate the subject. Right, it it kind of is creating a bit of that negative space that I was just mentioning that that Kenna can create in his images. But of course, he goes in the winter, which I'm going to show you that as well. Uh, and if you have snow around, then you can create all this. But this was done in August, right? So this was done uh, when uh, when there certainly the fields did have some color to them. But so Mark, is this infrared film or is this infrared digital? Uh, it is infrared digital. Um, and that's one of the things that I really enjoy about the um, uh, about the the camera as well that uh, it actually is infrared sensitive. So uh, so when I when I work with it, um, you know, I usually actually have to put a, a filter on that is a, a, a infrared light cut filter, right? And a UV light and infrared light cut filter, and you put that on, and then the camera creates. Uh, black and white images that are very similar to what normal film would have done, you know, visible spectrum, essentially. Um, and if you want to shoot infrared, then you put a filter on that does the opposite, that that basically uh, cuts out the visible light. So now what, you, what you're left with is infrared, and that creates these effects. Um, and of course, do you, you remember can... how many nano... Mark, do you remember I mean... how many nanometers your filter is? Uh, I have a few different ones. Um, and of okay. course, the higher the nanometers, the, the stronger the effect, right? Right. Um, yeah. I think uh, most, I mean, these two, the one that I use the most is, uh, is about a 780. Okay, thank you. Right, that, that, works, that works pretty well. But the thing is, it works differently on any camera, right? So uh, for anybody that's interested, of course, you can get one of those filters and put it on your camera. 
and even if your camera isn't infrared sensitive, because most manufacturers, they put a little, little infrared block filter in front of your sensor, right, to essentially prevent color shifts. Um, but if you put the filter on the front of the lens, you still get more infrared, like it still will look a little bit like it depends a little bit on the brand and, and you know, camera that you're, that you're working with. Um, and then, of course, you can also convert a digital camera to infrared, which I know some of you at least have, have done that. Um, and that can get you even closer. And then you can do some stuff in, in Photoshop to kind of create a sort of a faux infrared effect. But, uh, but if you're really wanting to try it out, I think uh, the filter is the, is the first step because it's the least expensive. And if you enjoy that, then you can look into like converting maybe an old camera that you don't need any longer. Right. And rather than having it sit in a drawer, you can convert it and then get a little bit deeper into the infrared. Um, I see it more as a, a tool of tonal control. Right. Let's go back here for a second. This one's infrared, too, uh, but it might be a lot um, might be less obvious. But once again, you know, I can shoot this straight. So meaning no infrared. And then I can take it into Photoshop and I can make a selection of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the 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 front, like of the grass in the front, it's actually grass here, like a, like a grassy hill. I can make a selection. I can brighten it up, and I get to pretty much the same result that I have now, right? I can get to a very similar result. I can do the same thing with with this, right? I'll just I'll just uh, uh, select the field, and I brighten it up, right? But the ability to do this already at capture is very appealing to me because then I have to do less on the computer, right? Like I'm already kind of getting closer there, right? I, I, which is the same idea of, of shooting with a black and white digital camera in the first place is to cut out steps in the processing. Um, and it doesn't usually result, by the way, in like less time spent, but I like to think that I'm spending that time on more important things. Right, cutting out the stuff that uh, that is sort of something that I could have gotten already right in the field. I don't have to worry about those things. I can now look at it and say, well, what else do I need to do to this? And then it still takes time to process, right? So it's not like uh, it's not been my experience that um, that you know having a black and white only camera has cut down the amount of of processing. I mean, I think in general maybe it actually has, but I would say the the more important takeaway is that it just changed what I have to do in the processing, if that makes sense. Right, and I love this one, uh, you know, I love this one too, with the fact that it, you know, it, it's one of those things about photography again, it's the memories, right? It's like, if you go here today, then that little secondary cabin there on the left is fallen down, right? I mean, it was barely holding on <laughs> in this, uh, when I was photographing this, right? Um, and it, so, so I, I love those things. I love the fact that, yes, this is there and it preserves the memory of the place, but it also ends up being that little detail of having that, that leaning secondary cabin in there. Without it, the photograph loses impact, right? It's about that juxtaposition. Um, and then even the third element, right? It's already like we all know that every structure there will end up like the one on the right, right? It's only a matter of years it'll all go down to that. So it's almost a bit of an evolution in this photograph, right? And even though these things are so in, incredibly simple, right? And when we take people to these locations, like some, some of the participants, you know, they, 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 they almost, I think they feel that uh, it's almost cheating because the photography is so simple, right? Um, because the snow is already there, right? So you don't have to really brighten up anything. Uh, and these, these scenes are there. And the interesting thing is you just learn that for these kind of photographs, one of the biggest and most important things to do is to get yourself there, right? And, and that's not without a challenge because these are taken sometimes at minus 20 Celsius, right? Uh, sometimes minus 30 Celsius. So a lot of people are not gonna be out photographing. Right, but if you can get yourself to go out in those kind of conditions, then this is the reward, right? That you can find these scenes that that are presented to you that are that are really almost perfect, if I can say that. Um, and all you got to do is like take one shot, 
uh, and then even the, the, the post-production is not going to be a big deal um, just because that landscape has already provided you with that. And I realized that um, the more experience I gained and then, you know, looking at Mark Akena's work, I realized a big part of his work is just being there, getting there. Right. Uh, and that doesn't diminish by any by any means that does not diminish the impact of his work. You know, in fact, I feel that that makes it even in a way that makes it even more admirable. Right. But it is not just camera. Right. And some people think all it takes is to buy the new camera, to buy the new lens. Uh, and now I can do these pictures. And you guys I think you guys are already, uh, uh, you know, more experienced in photography in general that you already know that's not the case. Right. Um, but it's just one of those less lessons that I think we all have to learn along the way. And then, you know, I find things like this, you know, which uh, I probably wouldn't have photographed before, but in all my travels, I think I've only seen one or two of these kind of scenes, you know, that toppled over uh, a grain bin here makes the shot, right? There's a gazillion little arrangements of several grain bins, but, but this one is fairly unique. So um, I had to stop here. This one, I mean, I couldn't set it up any better, you know, just the way that the, uh, that, that row was set up. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, once you can find it, it is relatively straightforward to take the photograph, but you have to find it. And, and for me, I, I just love that, you know, I just feel like, and sometimes, yeah, you might go out there and you go for a drive all day and you come back with nothing. I mean, that certainly has happened. But the days that that happened, I can honestly say I can count on one hand, right? Even when you think, well, I got lost all day, haven't really taken a picture. Um, before the day is over, you're still going to run into something. And then, you know, even if you don't, uh, I, I still enjoy it. There, there's, there's a peace and quiet. And, you know, going, on, going in a car and, and going on a drive on these back roads, I mean, it's the most relaxing thing. You know, it's like you forget about the emails and the stress at the job and the, uh, you know, whatever else might be going on. You're just there and you can explore it. And that's actually another takeaway because I have photographed a little bit in, in the city, but what really turns me away from the city is that I do not have those feelings. I feel like I have to look over my shoulder all the time. I'm, 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 I'm worrying about the security guard that might come up and say, hey, what are you doing here? You can't photograph. I, I worry about the traffic that, you know, the car that stops right in front of the composition that, you know, I worked on and, and now it's ruining it, right? And I'm not, I'm actually not relaxing, right? It, it, like there's distractions around me all the time. And because of that, it's harder for me to really concentrate and, and also enjoy the experience. While here, I mean, there's nothing, right? And I just, I just love that, that there's something about it. And in winter, it's even more desolate. And I mean, this farmer, I mean, God bless this farmer, right? I mean, it's just, again, the only ever uh, 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 pyramid of uh, silos, <laughs> you know, that, uh, that I've come across in, uh, in, in, in all these years. Got to pick it up a little bit because I see we're moving on here. Um, Hoarfrost, you know, just beautiful. So here's another um, photograph of that same tree. So this tree is the same as this, right? And, um, and this tree is the more obvious picture. Um, and I'm really happy. I mean, and, and this is still a good picture. It's a valid picture. There's nothing wrong with this. Um, and, and I worked to get it. I tried to get the camera as low as possible, but this was as low as I could get it. Um, and then, you know, we got here, I think we went here twice or three times even, and it was all about trying to make that, uh, that horizon line not be as pronounced, you know, trying to, because the horizon line kind of slices through the tree, which is why I would have loved to be lower on my, on my viewpoint. Um, but I think this way I can live with it. I love that little bit of a curve that's going on. Um, but to me, these days, this is much more satisfying, right? Because it's, it's, it's about more than just a tree. And these are a few more. 
of a more recent series. There's a lot of hay bales, let me tell you. And, uh, and it's very hard to photograph hay bales. Um, you know, you drive by and you think, man, I, I got to photograph these, these look great. Then you bring the camera out and it's like, oh my God, this does not work. Like, how do I take a decent photograph of these hay bales? <laughs> and I'm not saying that, uh, that you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, 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 you know, uh, the best ever, but I certainly worked hard. I tried to, uh, you know, position myself so I have the least overlap. Right, I tried to find a, a balanced composition, um, and I got really lucky with a bit of fog and mist in the background, so that uh, that you know the trees on the horizon. I didn't have to take them out in Photoshop. I could actually leave this pretty much straight like this, and I love the fact that so you still have the depth, you still have the atmosphere, but you actually, um, but you actually they're not distracting, right? If the background was more visible, it would be distracting. You know, and uh, Mark, I'd like to yep. make a comment. I yep. think it might be very interesting when you're working with infrared on a tripod to take a picture with infrared filters and then take it again without and then work with it in layers in Photoshop and see what you can work, get from it. That's a very good comment. You know, I have done that. Um, I have, I have, I have, I usually do take, when I do an infrared, I usually do a regular one as well, especially when, if the camera's on a tripod, I certainly do it because then it doesn't take that long. Um, but I can, but I, but I have to say, I haven't really tried to blend the two. So that would be interesting. Thank you. I'll, I'll try that. Take one area and then another area with. Oh, area. totally. And of course, you know, the lenses are not optimized for infrared. And, um, so you have all those issues. Oh, 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 oh totally right. Um, yeah, no, that would be an interesting thing to do. But that—that's the art. That's oh, ab we... absolutely, absolutely. I agree. I agree, and that's and it's fun to try that. And you know, and the infrared is also never as sharp, right? And it's uh, and it's harder to find, you know, the focusing point and 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 things like that. But uh, but again, it's just. I'm also, the longer I do photography, the more I embrace mistakes. You know, I would almost go as far as to say that these days I look for mistakes. I would almost go that far, you know, because the, I think there is a little bit of a threat of the quote unquote perfect image. You know, there, there's something about, you know, with digital, we can be, you know, like we can, we will check the histogram. We, we look at the image on the back of the monitor and, and like we can get it so perfect we can focus stack we can hdr we can do all these things and in the end you know we get we get that quote unquote perfect image but it's perfect maybe from a from a technical point but it's soulless or lifeless or fails to move us emotionally right and i'm not saying that blurry images now all of us uh, like you know move you automatically because they're blurry that, that's not the case, but sometimes, you know, if you got an image and there's something about that image that works and it's not the sharpest, then it doesn't matter, right? Because what matters is that you captured that something special. So, uh, so I, I, I try to embrace that, right? There's two more here um, on this section. There's this one, actually there's three more. Um, and this one, this is just a pile of dirt, right? And we, we actually ended up uh, uh, meeting the farmer and uh, there was a bit of a, a heated argument. And in the end, the, 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 the story ended with him inviting us to his property. Um, you know, once he actually figured out what we were really doing, um, you know, and getting over the fact that we're, we're not trespassing and we're not uh, hunting, you know, or, or, or trying to, you know, cause him any harm, uh, you know, because we have, we had, we, this was with a, with a workshop group. So we have two big suburbans. Uh, rolling up to his gate and you know we were photographing from the road but we're not invisible <laughs> right so uh, it was pretty uh, pretty obvious what we were doing and uh, and and he was really uh, uh, questioning that um, but a really nice guy um, you know and it's it's just it, it takes I couldn't have taken this 10 years ago you know it's just it's a pile of dirt now I, I loved it because of uh, uh, of the little bit of snow pattern on that on that uh, uh, on that dirt, and there was 
there's just something about it and it is the prairie like this is the kind of stuff that you see and with everything being so flat it, this does stand out right but it's not the kind of subject it's not the subject matter right it's you tell somebody yeah, i took a, a picture of dirt on the prairie you know they they're gonna they're gonna chuckle <laughs> at least right but uh but there's just something for me that 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 just goes beyond those initial pictures so or the initial uh, uh grain bins and and again that's that's okay like the the you know those those grain grain elevators that are photographs that they're still valid they're a big part of my history um but uh but but this is sort of the the modern type of it now a couple more things that are maybe not so obvious when i post this on, in, on instagram i often get people that comment and say well i would have never thought about you know, taking pictures of this, right? Like, why would you take a picture of a of a power pole? Well, same thing with a with a pile of dirt, right? Now, I don't know because um, I realize I guess I'm pretty close to one hour, so um, I can maybe do this in ten minutes. But just posting the question if that's okay for you guys to uh, to stay another ten minutes. My vote is for additional ten minutes. Yeah, I. I think so. I understand that you know we 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 are shooting for nine o'clock generally speaking. So if people uh, need to check out, uh, uh, please feel free to do that. But if there's uh, interest, and I think there probably is, in, in going another ten, uh, let's go ahead. All right. Okay. I'm going to go quicker here now. Some uh, original photograph about the original waterfall series that uh, that I did in about. Uh, oh, coming on to 10 years ago, right? Once again, a little bit more representational. Uh, still, incredibly enough, I mean, I was even surprised. This is one of the, this, this work is among the most successful work I've done in terms of awards and print sales, um, which again, I was quite surprised. Um, even though when I did this, I wanna say there wasn't as many of these type of images out there, but certainly today, you know, we've all seen a million of these kind of, waterfalls, right? So when I went back this, um, this past year, 2020, this is what I did. And once again, for me, I think also because I'm coming from those other images and that's, that's sort of my history, but, but this is infinitely more satisfying to me now. Um, but I can also see how this would be a lot less uh, successful in a gallery setting and print sales and likes on Instagram and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, well, Mark, which I don't- you, Mark, did you shoot yeah. these with that Cambo film camera or are these, what did you- sh No, this is, this is with the, uh, uh, this is with uh, digital. This is with, uh, with the phase one. Mark, on the left-hand side, uh, and this is the second time I've seen this picture, because of that narrow part in the middle, mm -hmm. And then there's a slight uh, slope. I'm seeing a human figure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm yeah. The neck and shoulders. I'm seeing arms and torso. Absolutely. Uh, oh, and you, okay, you're seeing that as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you saw that. I didn't want to mention that because everybody see. It. Some people see it, and then some people don't. And once you start to notice it, then you can't take your eye away from it again away. right <laughs> and i was seeing it the first time and i thought is that really what he intended mm. i didn't um i would be lying if i if i said that i did because um these are really fairly unpredictable when you take them right, right? so uh i mean i can tell you that once i saw this direction that this is what i was able to do i i took more of them Right, so I will go that far in terms of intent, but when I first got to that waterfall, um, I I was just uh, open. I was just open mind, like okay, let's try something, let's see what happens, and uh, and then I I did a few, and this is of course another great thing about digital that you you do see it on the back of the screen, and uh, and then if you like what you see, you can do a little bit more of that, right, and that is inherently helpful. Um, so, uh, so once I saw that, that this is kind of what I was trying to get because I'm moving the camera. So this is all very hard to repeat exactly. Right. So, so you have to like, so I did 
I must have done at least 50 frames, um, you know, 30 seconds about each, even though I think I went up to about one minute, then it ended up to be too blurry. Then I went down to about five seconds and it was kind of too realistic. So that's another variable that you're playing with, right? So, so I was certainly trying to be smart once I had a few testers to play around with it. And then I did notice it in the field and work a little bit more, but I did not set out to do this when I first got out of the car. Let's just say that. <coughs> so Mark, this is, uh, those are intentional camera movement shots, right? Yes. And yeah. uh, you say 30 seconds. So are, are, you're on a tripod when you're doing this, right? I am, yes. Yeah, okay. Because uh, 30 seconds on an intentional camera movement is, uh, so you're, you're manipulating the camera as you're moving it vertically? I mean, you're not setting it on any kind of a, a device that automatically uh, tilts it down for you, you're doing? No, 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 I did. So basically the, what, how this works is, uh, is a little bit, uh, uh, again, it's, it's quite proprietary to phase one because they have a, they have a feature called uh, frame averaging. And the best way I can describe this, it's, it's, it's a little bit like multiple exposure. Mm -hmm. right, which is available on, on, on more cameras, most cameras these days, right? Um, but the way that frame averaging works is you take a whole bunch of, of, of uh, regular exposures, quote unquote, right, at a 250th or 500, whatever it and ends up being, and you take it over a period, in this case of 30 seconds, and then, the, and then actually inside the camera, oh. these images are being averaged, right? So, and the difference is, so that's very similar to doing to doing this with multiple exposure, but the difference is these are about a thousand single frames that are being, you know, that are being averaged. If you do it with multiple exposure, most cameras only have about 10. Right. So what I've done with, uh, with, with uh, students, what I've worked on is, uh, you know, do about five of those 10, you know, and then in Photoshop, put those on top. So now you have about 50. Right, and then you can actually create something that's that's very close. I mean, this is there's a smoothness to this mm -hmm. that I think you're getting because you're having that many frames. Right, mm -hmm. um, but this can this can be created in 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 Photoshop. Uh, it's just that it takes a, a lot of time and a lot of crazy computer power because uh, uh, you know if you're doing this as layers and then you're shifting each layer and things like that. Uh, you know, your, your file becomes very big, very quickly, right? Yeah, I've done a bit of uh, intentional camera movement with just, uh, uh, you know, physically, just taking, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 seconds, say, and moving my, or yeah. less even, just moving exactly. my camera down without. Exactly, exactly. And I think here, you know, you could get this with doing that, you know, you just do maybe a few seconds of no movement, and then that will burn sort of that scene into the, that that will, that will bring out some detail and then you start to move at the end and you probably get something closer in this case, mm -hmm. right? So there, yeah. is, there is some opportunity with this. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and quite honestly, I mean, this is, uh, this is a great example. I wanted to mention that too. This is really something that, that I got inspired by, uh, um, by Andy, um, you know, because, uh, because, and this is what I love about teaching. And I mean, in this case, mentoring, which is even sort of teaching in, on, a, on a much deeper level, the way how I see it, is that uh, I, it's totally both ways. It's not a one-way street, right? I teach somebody, but I get so much back. Sure. Um, and, you know, and, and so this is, you know, totally an homage. Like I wouldn't have tried this if it wasn't for Andy, right? And, uh, uh, and maybe I would have, you know, but, uh, but I, I, I definitely want to give him credit for it because, uh, you know, seeing what he did and, uh, and working with him on, 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 on his photographs that does this, I was like, you know what, I can do that now too on my camera. Let's try this, right? And then uh, also having, I think, uh, if, don't want to speak for him, but having a, a similar experience of satisfaction with the results so that I thought, okay, this is interesting. I want to add that to my arsenal. It's not that every photograph is like this, but for the appropriate scene, you know, it, it works, right? So these I'm gonna do very quick. And then I'm, I think there was maybe, let's see, there was uh, maybe one more point here. 
Um, I mean, this is kind of interesting, right? Same, same location. That's always important, I think, to do this. Uh, maybe this one is, the, is a good one to, to, to uh, stop, of, um, stop at. So this is, you know, I was driving down this, uh, the, the ring road in Iceland, well-traveled road. I saw this sort of a uh, um, mist on the horizon and these are the Vestmanir Islands in the South. And, and I just love that condition, right? I, I, I just, you know, I looked at that, uh, I, I looked at that haze and I thought, okay, I'm going to, I want to go down to the south, to the coast and see if I can photograph it. And that's all it took. And I just took a random right turn, which, which ended up being not paved, of course. And I'm going down this road and the sun is right in my face, right? The sun is, I'm, I'm, the sun is right behind uh, those, uh, um, those mountains, which are the, the, the island. So I have my, um, I have my, um, what's that called again? My flap down in the car, right? To um, what's that called again? The visor. visor. The visor. <laughs> I'm losing my English here. Hopefully not. Uh, so I have my visor down, right? Because it's the, because uh, the sun is literally right coming in my eyes, and uh, and through that I see all of a sudden a little bit of uh, of of ice or snow left in the tracks. And I thought again, you know, what a gift for photographers. So that photo on the left is in fact taken from my driver's seat with the visor down through the windshield. This is exactly what I saw and I just photographed it, right? And it is not the sharpest as a result, um, but that's, you know, that, that's one of the things that I mean about caring a little bit less about the technology now and for me, it was important to capture that look. And without, you know, the, 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 the black top is actually the visor, you know, and without having that, I mean, I could have gotten outside, set up my tripod, thought about, you know, coming up with a, coming down with a flag. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a lens hood wouldn't have helped um, in this case, because the sun was so low on, the, uh, on, on its angle. Uh, I could have gotten to something like this, um, but this is what, you know, this is what was important and then after I got this, I finally did make it to the coast. And here, you know, I could have focus stacked the image on the right, you know, because the foreground mountains, yes, they are, they're not mountains, they're actually rocks on the beach. They're like a breakwater, right? And, and sure, I could have focus stacked it to get that sharp as well. And I did take the picture. So I do have a, a, a one frame where the, where the rocks in the foreground are sharp. And then I just, and then I refocused on the, on infinity. So I didn't fully focus stack it, but I did take the two shots, but I decided to actually settle in on this one um, because again, what's more important than the actual perfect focus to me is the, uh, is the repetition of shape, right? And having oh. that foreground in there. Um, so I was, I, I'm okay with going like this, like, like this and not having the, the perfect focus in the, in the belief that, uh, that, that still the overall message of the photograph translates though. What I love about digital is the spontaneity. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I do, you know, I, I do love that too. Um, and, uh, and it's something, you know, with long exposure, you have to be on a tripod, obviously. And, uh, and, and so I do think that even though I'm very good on a tripod because I had to do it so many times, like I don't, I don't really feel that the, that the tripod um, slows me down a lot, but it does. And these are two examples, you know, even though the one on the right was taken on a tripod. Um, but I do think it is important to, to notice that even a tripod can be a bit of a crux, you know, like it can uh, sort of give you that predetermined vantage point. You know, that's not always obvious to question. Uh, and it can sort of give you the more oh, rigid, you know, uh, rigid way of viewing because you are on a tripod now. So it's important to break away from that sometimes and just go handheld. Totally agree. Mark? Yes. Uh, what I really like about the photograph on the right is that the foreground is part of my peripheral vision. And so it's not going to be sharp. And if I'm focusing on the background or the midground, in this photograph. And if it was sharp, if you had 
focus stacked it and made it sharp, it wouldn't look real and it wouldn't be more, it wouldn't be a memory of mine. It would be a pretty cliched picture. And this yeah. is not, this is real. This is the way I would see it. Thank you, Andy, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good way to think about it. Thank you. I think I'll I think I'll stop here. Um, there's so many photographs, but very little time. <laughs> but I really appreciated all you guys' questions. And if you got more, I'm I'm game to uh, to hang out more. Um, I love well, questions. So, <laughs> I uh, Mark, we really appreciate the presentation. Really interesting and some beautiful work. Um, but I think we will. We'll probably need to leave it at this and uh, let people um, uh, get on with their evenings. But um, again, we really, uh, really thank you for the presentation. Thank you for uh, especially uh, <laughs> being up so early in Germany. It's uh, um, it's uh, we're really appreciative. Well, thank you again uh, for uh, for giving me the opportunity and. Um, yeah, and hopefully I will see you guys again one of these days. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well done. All thank right, you. everyone. Well, thank you very much. And uh, until next time, I think that's uh, that's a wrap. All right. All right. So long. Good night. Thank Thanks, you, Doug. Doug.